now. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to VEGU 21, which, of course, is this year's virtual annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. Um, this year, we have more than 14,000 abstracts and about 16,000 researchers from around the globe participating. I'm Terry Cook, and I'm EGU's Head of Media Communications and Outreach, and I'll be hosting today's press conference, and it will include a question and answer period um, after the presentations by our speakers. To allow for you, the members of the media, to ask your own questions, we're conducting this as a Zoom meeting. And so once the last speaker has finished, you're welcome to either type your question into the chat or put a queue, and then I'll call on you, um, and you'll be able to ask your question directly. If for any reason Zoom suddenly quits, um, I'll restart the press conference and just give everyone a few minutes to rejoin the session, but hopefully that will not happen. Um, just wanted to let you all know that the abstracts um, and other documents relating to this press conference and all of the other ones as well um, have been uploaded onto the document section um, of our online press center. And you can access that using the website media.egu.eu. Uh, and so please check there for more information and also for images. So it's my honor now to introduce our panelists and I'm gonna introduce all of them at once just to make for faster transitions in between. So this press conference is recent wildfire research, understanding impacts, assessing risk um, and reducing hazards. Um, and, and I'm not sure uh, why I haven't heard from Benedetto de Rosa. He's not able to join us. Um, if he does come in late, then he'll be the last speaker. Um, but he would be more than happy to answer questions by email, um, and I can provide that. So our first speaker today will be um, Bruno Aparicio from the University of Lisbon. Um, we have a pre-recorded presentation next from Dirk Thielen, who's from the Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. He's also joined us. Um, his internet connection is fluctuating, but he will hopefully be able to answer questions um, in the chat at least, and um, is more than happy to answer questions by email as well. Um, and then we will also hear from Samuel Luthi, who's from ETH Zurich. So thank you very much. Um, and I will now hand things over um, to Dr. Aparicio. Thank you, Terry. Uh, um, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so my name is Bruno Paricio. I'm a PhD student at Forest Research Center at University of Lisbon. And I'll be talking about our work in combining wildfire behavior, simulations, and complex network theory to support fuel management. Uh, this work was support, supported by NSA, Francisco Santos, Chiara Bruni, and Jose Freira. And before starting, I would like to thank Terry for the invitation to be here today. Uh, and if after this session, you find, you find yourselves with questions or doubts, please, please feel free to contact me. So um, this is a question that we often have in mind. So can science help decision makers to reduce large wildfires? And uh, uh, before, before starting to explain how can we do this? Um, we need to understand the relevance of this question and the relevance of the answer. So the answer is yes, we can help decision makers. And this is relevant because the number of wildfires in Europe is decreasing, but interannual variability is increasing. This means that bad fire seasons are becoming worse and worse. So we, we are experiencing more intense wildfires that are more difficult to suppress and have uh, more severe consequences. Uh, this is due to a, a large set of reasons, but the main reason is the, the abandonment of the countryside, which leads to fuel, uh, fuel accumulation and in turn uh, basically transform our landscape, the European landscape, into a prone landscape for large wildfires. Uh, so what is our contribution? Basically, there are many ways to study wildfires. And one method that is, is currently used is to use uh, models to simulate fire behavior. The problem is that this, the, the model's outputs are very often, uh, uh, they are often very specific, which make them difficult to communicate with decision makers. So what we did was to use complex network theory to interpret the model's outputs. 
So let us start with the basic. Uh, what is a network? Um, a network is basically a set of different nodes and links that are connecting our, our network. So what we did was to run the wildfire simulations. We stored the outputs regarding wildfire behavior. And then on top of those outputs, we generated uh, the network. So imagine that we have a landscape, okay? Here it's represented by squares and rectangles where each square represents a, a unique patch or a unique parcel of land. And on top of that, we generated the centroids, the nodes that are connected to all of its neighbors by links, okay? So we have now a network that is very similar to the original landscape. So because now we have a network, we can actually implement and use different metrics to study the network. So we used this, this metric called giant component to understand what is the largest extent of area that has the potential to burn with few opportunities for ground-based suppression. So we know that above a given threshold of fire intensity, ground-based suppression will have a low effectiveness. So what we did was to account for all of the continuous area above this given threshold to quantify what is the largest extent of area where we basically have just a few opportunities for ground-based suppression. Then we also generated a new metric called directional index of wildfire connectivity that basically allows us to identify the most important areas for connectivity. So here, uh, this, the way that this metric works is that uh, not only is important the intensity that each parcel, each node in the landscape can burn, but also where that patch or that parcel is located in the landscape. So in this example, uh, we have this particular parcel that burns at a high intensity, but because it is located in an area where its neighbors also burn at a high intensity, then we say that this is a particular, a particular uh, uh, area of interest under this metric. So how can we help? Uh, we applied these metrics to the Serra de Monchique, uh, located in Southern Portugal. Uh, Serra de Monchique is a Mediterranean area, very prone to large wildfires. And because of that, uh, in the past, it was suggested the implementation of this fuel break network. So these solid black lines that, we see, that you see here is the entire fuel break. Uh, which is composed by 3,500 hectares. And we can imagine a fuel break to, to, to be something similar to this. So we have a forest and in between we have this fuel break that basically breaks the continuity of the, of the forest. Uh, let me just say that this fuel break network was never impl implemented, okay? So because it was never implemented, we asked ourselves, can we actually identify some of the priority fuel breaks uh, to implement. So we applied those metrics that I just present to you. Um, and actually we can indeed identify some, some priority areas. So here under the giant component, which basically tells us which is uh, and where it is located the largest area where we don't have opportunities for ground-based suppression, uh, we see that these two particular fuel breaks are the most important in the entire network. And when we take into perspective the directional index of wildfire connectivity, which basically tells us where are the, the parcels, the areas that are more prone to spread a wildfire in the landscape, we see that we basically have four different fuel breaks that are a, a top priority. In a more detailed way, when we look at the landscape in a more reactive perspective, uh, to break up the largest area with few opportunities for ground-based suppression, we basically need two fuel breaks of around 300 hectare, hectares to basically reduce this metric by 50%. We, when we take a more preventive perspective uh, of the landscape, basically to stop or to limit the, wild the wildfire spreading in the landscape, we basically need four fuel breaks of almost 600 hectares to reduce this metric in 40%.
So basically, what I'm trying to say is that we don't need to implement the whole uh, 3,500 fuel break network to have a meaningful impact in, uh, in reducing the hazard in the landscape. So uh, take home messages. We do have the tools to identify priority areas for fuel reduction. Uh, and the fact that our recommendations are often overlooked is also a political decision. And I'll, I'll like to add on that it's more and more a political decision rather than a technological limitation on, on our sides. Uh, the second take home message is that, is that the use of graph-based tools in wildfire research allows to further reduce uncertainty since we are looking at the landscape in a different perspective, which will contribute to manage wildfire risk more efficiently. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. And thank you so much. Thank you. So for the next presentation um, is pre-recorded. This sound is a little bit faint. Um, and so I'll, I'll play it through. The sound's um, set on maximum right now, but if anyone would like me to send them the presentation so you can play it on your own computer, I'm happy to do that afterwards. Please just email me. Good afternoon, my name is Kate Keenan. I'm head of the Laboratory of Landscape, Ecology and Climate from the from Venezuelan Institute for Scientific Research. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, we want to thank you for your interest in this presentation and uh, your interest in our research, uh, which deals with uh, Pantanal's historical drought, that the extreme drought that's currently affecting the Pantanal. Let us remember the Pantanal is the largest wetland in the world, and together with the Amazonas and Cerrado represents one of the most important uh, biodiversity hotspots not only in Brazil, but in South America. Now, because this ongoing extreme drought affecting the Pantanal, unprecedented fires have occurred, uh, affecting, directly affecting, severely affecting over 30% of its uh, extension. We are, in the present research, we are uh, concerned about some key issues, such as evolution. Uh, evolution regarding dynamics on temporal and spatial dynamics. Also, a very important contribution we're making with this research is, is identifying the causes, the determinants that uh, make uh, such a drought so severe, so prolonged, and, uh, and using that evidence for forecasting, not only the current drought, but also the potentiality of uh, um, occurring future extreme events affecting the, the um, ecosystem functioning of these important uh, wetlands. Now, these two sets of figures give us information about what, ha what has been the evolution, the time and space dynamics of the, of the drought. We can see that drought started already in 2019 and since March 2020 until present, the over 70% of the area of the Pantanal has been, has had a, a sustained, extremely, extremely dry condition. We can see that, appreciate that better here in this graph. And also very important, we can see here that even though we are ending a rainy season, such as this one here, we are starting a dry season with an extremely dry condition, with uh, showing a very important uh, deficit in precipitation. As mentioned, uh, another key issue we are very interested in is identifying the determinants of this variability, the precipitation variability in the Pantanal area, such as the occurrence of this dry process and very specifically, this current drought that's affecting the Pantanal. For this, we established correlations between monthly precipitation and sea surface temperature. From this exercise, we identified uh, eight specific um, oceanic regions, uh, five in the so southern hemisphere, which have a very strong and very positive 
correlation with the precipitation dynamics here, meaning that the warming in this uh, oceanic region would result in wet pulses, as we can see here. We look at the explain it this wet the presence of these wet pulses, while in the northern hemisphere we identify three specific oceanic uh, regions with uh, also very strong uh, correlation, but negative with precipitations here in the in the Pantanal, meaning that the warming in the in one or more of these uh, oceanic regions would be uh, negative correlated would be uh, um, uh, correlated with the presence of dry pulses, the occurrence of dry, in important dry and extended dry pulses in the Pantanal area. Now, a significant trend in warming has been identified for these three oceanic regions, which have been uh, uh, correlated negatively with precipitations in the Pantanal. And this uh, trend is more important here, specifically in the here in the Northeast Pacific in this region. As we can see here, this specific region explains almost 86% of this, of the happening of this uh, very important current drought affecting the Pantanal area. Now, this significant trend in the warming of waters here in Northeast uh, Pacific has generated a marine heat wave condition since June 2019 and for almost constantly until present. Here we have it in red. This marine heat wave is uh, defined as the uh, when sea surface temperature surpasses 90th uh, percentile. Now this is not only a new concept, it is al also a new climatic uh, reality. There is a lot of uh, research, a lot of concern about the dynamics, the recent dynamics of this uh, phenomenon. There is uh, some researchers have uh, um, forecasted, here we can see that it, it is indeed a recent uh, phenomenon, that they are forecasting in the short term for an increase not only in the duration of uh, marine heat waves in different uh, oceanic regions, which would include the ones we are concerned, but also for an intensification of such events. Results from this research show that precipitations at the Pantanal area are most sensible to the dynamics and presence of marine heat waves in certain oceanic regions. Uh, for example, there is uh, the, the current extreme drought affecting the Pantanal can be explained by the presence of a very prolonged and very intense uh, marine heat wave here in Northeast uh, Pacific. Now, there is uh, currently there is a trend, very significant trend for uh, warming of these three specific oceanic regions, which were established to have a high correlation with a dry the, the, the occurrence of dry pulses and droughts in the Pantanal area. From this evidence, we can forecast for the, for the Pantanal area that an, in, uh, an increase in the trend for an extremely dry condition in the Pantanal area, as well an extension in such trend, at least for two more years. Now, this uh, marine uh, heat wave situation, which uh, there, is, uh, there is a forecast for an extension in its duration as well as an intensification. This most certainly would generate a new climate reality, very difficult, if not impossible, for the Pantanal to overcome. I want to stop here and thank, uh, thank you again for your interest in this topic. And to remind you, I am completely available for, for any further question or any inquiry you may have about regarding this investigation. Thank you very much. Dirk, for, for sending that in. Um, and again, if you were not able to hear the sound very clearly, please um, just send me an email and I'd be happy to share that. Um, and at the end there, he emphasized that he's happy to answer questions by email um, if he's not able to join us um, later on for the Q&A period. So we'll now turn to um, um, Dr. Samuel Luthi um, from ETH Zurich. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. 
Um, do you see my slides in presentation mode? Fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, hello also from, from my side. Uh, my name is Sam uh, Luthi. I'm a PhD student here at DTH uh, here in Zurich. And uh, thanks a lot also from my side to Terry for, uh, for the invitation to talk uh, at this press conference. Um, where I get the chance to, to present to you what we've been working on uh, uh, over the past year on, on uh, economic damages of wildfires. And that's uh, work that I obviously haven't done alone. So uh, the Gabriela, Dr. Gabriela Snarsiguan and my professor David Bresch, uh, who are very much involved, but also I mean, many other of the whole uh, weather and climate risk group uh, here in our team, as obviously research is quite often a, a team effort. and. Uh, a chat over coffee is sometimes as, as important as a concrete input uh, in a meeting. Um, so what we do generally here with the, with the weather and climate risk group is we, we try to estimate uh, impacts and model impacts uh, of natural disasters or of, of climate extremes. And uh, we look at uh, often at infrastructure damages, so at the US dollar, uh, but also at, for example, how people are getting displaced uh, under flooding, et cetera. And um, this, this trait of, of research um, is actually only very recently an, an academic uh, trait for, for a long time. It, it used to be within the, rather within the, the insurance uh, industry, so rather within the private sector, um, where uh, reinsurers or um, yeah, insurers uh, tried to model uh, impacts of typically of large uh, natural hazards uh, as a uh, hurricanes, tropical cyclones, earthquakes, flooding, etc., uh, to price their policies uh, accordingly. And obviously, um, they, uh, they had a focus on, on the richer uh, regions of this world, uh, where the biggest uh, losses uh, would come up. So there was the focus was very much on, on the US, uh, on, on Japan, on Australia, uh, or also in Europe, and also mainly on, uh, on hurricanes or on earthquakes. Um, there was relatively little attention uh, to, to economic impacts uh, of wildfires. Uh, and that's also, um, I mean, if you look at, uh, at the figures, and that's uh, Swiss Re who published those, um, that in the time period from the 1980s to 2015, uh, insured losses uh, from, from wildfires were only two percentage of the, of the whole losses of the industry. And this number has gone crazily up to 12 percentage uh, in the last five years. So in the period uh, 2016 to 2020, so up two percentage to 12 percentage. And obviously that brought a, a lot of uh, attention to the topic and I mean, the insurance industry is now uh, all over it. So they're publishing reports, et cetera, et cetera. And also more and more um, as we see that, that uh, more and more investors uh, in the financial world want to have a look or want to know the climate risks of what they're investing in. They, they also keep asking this question, hey, are you exposed to this sort of natural catastrophe of, to climate risk? And so uh, now insurers also started modeling wildfires slowly, but um, obviously what they do is uh, they have their proprietary models focusing on, on the very rich regions of the world. And, um, and uh, that is a bit different to what we do here at the Weather and Climate Risk Group, as we want to be uh, open source, open data, open access, so that, that everybody can work with our model and that we only rely on data that is uh, available for free and publicly uh, available. And thus, we also uh, work a lot with, uh, with NGOs as the World Bank, so people that uh, want to have a, an idea of, uh, of disaster risk uh, for, for specific countries. Uh, in the whole world. And so uh, when we uh, try to model uh, impacts of natural catastrophes, then as nearly with any modeling, you basically need to perform two tasks. Uh, the first one, more or less being able to explain what happened in the past. Uh, and the second one, uh, the what could happen. So what is the risk, what is in the system? And um, so the concept of, uh, of how we go about this, of how uh, we model climate risk, uh, is that we see that risk uh, hinges on these three components. And that's a definition uh, put forward by the IPCC, so the governmental, intergovernmental panel on climate change. 
um, that uh, this have this free components hazard exposure and vulnerability. Um, the hazard is basically anything nature throws at you. So that in our case, that's wildfires, but that can also be storm, uh, flood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And exposure is uh, the variable uh, that you want to look at. So that can be infrastructure, uh, houses, uh, can be people. Um, the vulnerability is basically then how your exposure will react to a hazard. So if you have a, a house that is very well isolated, that uh, doesn't burn that easy, has a lower vulnerability as compared to a stable filled with hay. And uh, as I said, we uh, work with open data and globally consistently. Um, so uh, here, just to illustrate that we have that data available for the whole world, uh, but our focus uh, on impacts of, uh, of the wildfire last, that occurred last year in Australia to have a bit of a better grasp on example. Um, so what we did uh, for, for the hazard is uh, uh, we used the satellite data on fire, which is made available uh, via uh, NASA, via NASA mission, it's called MODIS uh, mission. Um, so we use their data that we know at what time and where a fire of what intensity occurred. And then we overlap that with, ex with our exposure layer. Uh, our exposure layer here is uh, generated uh, using light, uh, night light intensity uh, so that um, I mean, buildings uh, glow in the night, so we have a rough idea where what infrastructure uh, is. And then we overlap these two, uh, two grids or these two maps and can calculate uh, using some vulnerability aspects, uh, uh, economic impacts, uh, spatially especially aggregated. Um, that's very important to do that, obviously, uh, spatially um, explicit. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, you probably don't see it on the slide, but there's a relatively small dot in Melbourne, which uh, caused a lot of, of damages because uh, there's a lot of infrastructure. While these mega fires here um, didn't cause as much uh, economic damages um, because there's simply not as, man as much infrastructure as uh, close to a city in the urban wildfire, uh, uh, urban yeah, wild interface. Um, obviously, that, that's other impacts that occurred there, uh, uh, biological uh, carbon impacts, but uh, we don't look at these now. So it's th I would don't want to say these fires are not too important. It's just for that case. Um, so that's how we look at uh, past impacts. And if we want to look at what could happen, then uh, we have uh, this uh, way of generating or simulating fires. Uh, so we do that. Uh, relatively easy that we can do it everywhere in the globe that we don't depend on too much data um, so it's basically we have this uh, random uh, random walk algorithm where we start at the random point and then we let that fire grow uh, depending on some properties that we can give uh, to the map and so we simulate a couple thousand ten thousand uh, fires uh, like that and then we we sample from those to uh, what we call uh, simulated fire season. So we try to generate fire season and it's actually a coincidence that it's Portugal, but uh, probably in Iceland. Um, so uh, on the left, you see historic fire season. So what happened uh, in the past? And then uh, we have roughly 20 years of satellite data. And obviously that is not enough to have a proper impact assessment. So we try to generate a couple of hundred thousand uh, of these fire seasons to, to see what, what, what is in there. Um, I'd very much give you a number of the actual climate change risk, uh, but as this is very hard uh, to come up at the current time or we're not there yet uh, because there's so many driving factors and because if we only look at past data, uh, we are going to underestimate quite heavily as we see there's such a strong trend um, in wildfire risk. And I think that's probably a bit part of the story that we see here or generally going on, um, that it's already hard uh, to simulate uh, damages uh, from uh, from natural hazards. Uh, it's already hard and with uh, with the climate crisis with this extreme shift, uh, it's gotten increasingly increasingly harder uh, to figure out what risk we actually are in. And I think that that is uh, definitely something to be very concerned about that we are uh, if we're looking at natural catastrophes that we're uh, we need to, yeah, there, we're going into rough uncertainty. Um, 
yeah, I think that's from my side. I'm happy to take any question later. Here are some com uh, complex details and uh, yeah, happy to discuss it. <laughs> Sorry for being a bit long. Great. Well, we'd be happy to open up to questions. Um, right now, Dr. Uh, Thielen is um, in the room, virtual room here. So um, we could ask questions at least through the chat of him um, um, as well as um, Dr. Aparicio and um, Samuel Lucy. People are, are debating what they'd like to ask. Um, I actually had a question um, about the first presentation. Um, and so I wanted to actually ask you, you mentioned that it's there's a scientific process um, Dr. Aparicio, and you mentioned that there's also a political process, and presumably there's also a, a budgetary process as well that goes into those fire breaks. Um, and so I'm curious, have you had personal experience, you know, interacting between all those realms? Um, and what do you also think that scientists can do and, and advocate so that the best possible science is used when those decisions are made? Good question. Uh, I We haven't made uh, a formal contact with the decision makers in the Moshink region. Uh, what we did, I mean, because this, this is a novel, uh, this is a new work, I mean, in, in these confusing times, it's hard um, to, to sit down with decision makers. But what we did was to establish a connection with the civil protection, so firefighters. We showed them our results in a different uh, study area. And um, they, they were ha very happy with these results actually, because it goes, uh, uh, it, it's more or less aligned with their knowledge on the, on the, on the field. Uh, it's more or less aligned on what are their concerns. Um, so, so basically decision, decision makers will now be uh, pressured in different fronts. So on one side, uh, it's basically academia saying we need to do this or that. Then we know that we, then we know uh, we have people that know uh, the terrain, the land, and are, are also demanding some changes. Uh, so there's obviously room and need for, for, for something to change. In Portugal, the large majority of investment goes to fire suppression. So since 2000, the year 2000, we, uh, we apply three times as uh, three, three times much uh, uh, money into suppression than, than into, 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 preve uh, into prevention. Of course, it's costly, but we don't need to implement the entire fuel break in one, week, one, in, 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 in one, week, one year. So we, we have room uh, to more or less uh, uh, implement bit by bit, okay? So we don't need to, to have a big expense, expensive fuel break from from year from year zero to your year one, so it can be uh, uh, bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and presumably it'll have to be you know proceed bit by bit. But um, yeah, changing the way the budgets are allocated, I think, is a big part of the issue. So there's no questions currently in the chat, but I did actually have one for you. Um, Samuel, I was just wondering when you were talking about, you know, the, the modeling that you're doing and you talked about uh, examples in Portugal, you talked about examples, you know, in Australia as well. Um, I was wondering what the main application is. Is this more for like insurance companies trying to figure out, you know, how, how to work it in terms of, you know, their rates or is this more in terms of fire suppression or, you know, trying to, to fight fires? Um, I think at this stage, that this granularity as we're doing it, it's rather um, work that also it's rather on the focus for people that uh, look at the portfolio. Uh, so like uh, insurance companies, or as, uh, as I mentioned, as, uh, for example, investors that uh, need to take uh, uh, climate risks into their uh, consideration, but also generally uh, for, I think, governmental authorities or countries uh, that should have a rough idea of, of uh, costs of natural disasters. I think uh, for, for adaptation, um, you need a much more local knowledge uh, than what we produce. I mean, we're in this trade-off uh, with trying to do something that works uh, all around the globe, so having global consistency, and probably that helps identifying hotspots, obviously. Uh, but once you're gonna uh, go towards uh, direction of adaptation, then obviously 
uh, the work uh, as, as Bruno uh, is doing it is, is much more relevant there. You need to have uh, local stakeholders. You need to act with people on the ground that actually know uh, in very much detail how does the landscape look like. Uh, so we're a bit in this trade-off. Um, and I think in, in that uh, that format it is now, it, it's rather for people that uh, that want to have a global consistent uh, picture of something. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that sure strikes me about all of this research is that it happens on very different geographic scales and it happens on very different time scales too. So Dirk was talking about you know, there's a two or a three month kind of advance warning, you know, in terms of sea surface temperatures before they see the drought and the pantanol. And it seems like that that's maybe one of the issues is that, you know, the firefighters are working on a different time frame than policymakers who are different, you know, and then the scientists are kind of spread across the spectrum. And is that, would you say that that's one of the biggest challenges in advancing, you know, wildfire research, or is it simply that the climate is changing so quickly? What what do you think? Well, sorry, I got it, yeah. Um, I think one of the really of the key challenges is, is that the, the background climate is changing really, really rapidly. And I think that there's this very strong, I mean, you see it on impacts uh, very strongly. And obviously fires have a, a big, big social component as well. So whether a fire starts, uh, it's not only uh, the climate, but also uh, if it's people that have a barbecue in the forest, uh, uh, or as we had it in the US this year, last year, uh, that do a gender reveal party in the forest that's gone bad. Um, so you have a big, big social impact as well. And I think regarding the time scale, it's definitely very, very helpful uh, if you have um, a uh, prevention uh, in place, uh, as, as Bruno suggests, uh, B, that you have a, a seasonal uh, forecast. So if you know that there's uh, information uh, conditions uh, that are in the climate system that you probably do a bit of more prevention at the uh, before uh, the fire season and then obviously uh, with the work uh, that we are doing um, that you basically just have an idea of what's going on is, is already a hard enough question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add on the, the answer of, of Samuel? We need to focus on things that we can change. Uh, climate change is it's, it's happening and it's going to happen and it's getting worse and worse and uh, uh, the emissions are continuing so so we are most likely going to have uh, severe consequences in our climate what we can change is our habits so ignitions and our landscape okay so we need to to, to have this local no lo local knowledge like Sema was suggesting but also at the same time we need to, to have this general picture of what's, what is happening uh, in, in, the, in the entire globe. Okay, so, so we need both, both approaches of really uh, large uh, scales, but also in the, in the local scale. So both, both approaches are quite interesting and they are answering to different questions, but together they, they, they basically build up the, the knowledge that we can provide. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I'm pleased to be able to now introduce um, Dr. Benedetto De Rosa, who's a researcher at the National Research Council at the Institute of Methodologies for Environmental Analysis um, in, in Italy. Dr. De Rosa, if you're ready, please go ahead and screen share and we'd love to hear your presentation. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, excuse me. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Benedetto De Rosa. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, today I'm talking about the, the determination of California forest fire aerosol properties observed in Potenza by the multi wavelength Raman LIDAR Musa. Let's start. The first part of my presentation deals with uh, biomass burning aerosols. Biomass burning aerosols are one of the key aerosol types in climate research. But what are atmospheric aerosols? Aerosols is a suspension of solid or liquid particles in the atmosphere. Aerosol uh, and clouds interaction are the larger starts of uncertainty in our understanding of climate system, uh, as we can see from the panel to the right. But why this uncertainty? 
clouds and areas of property vary at scale smaller than those resolved in climate models. So, biomass burning aerosols affect the energy balance in the atmosphere. The effect is uh, the effect is direct with the scatter and absorption of solar radiation and indirect with the interact with clouds. Uh, also, biomass burning aerosol can change the properties of the clouds in the atmosphere. Um, small and spherical smoke particles have um, a high um, um, <coughs> efficient, efficiency in the scattering. The smoke particles can be um, <coughs> uh, lifted at a high altitude with the deep convection. In, um, in the free troposphere, the pressure is lower, so uh, the fluke expand and the smoke can travel for great distances. During the transport, the particles are modified um, with uh, uh, a lot of physical processes, such as uh, hygroscopic water uptake and coagulation. So, um, coming back to the main point, uh, on 23rd October, the immense Sonoma fire scorched 3,000 hectares in a few days. Um, we, we know that forest fire smoke was transported over great distances and reached the south of Italy. As we can see from the forecast of biomass burning aerosol uh, provided by CAMPS at the analysis of the back trajectories. So, LiDAR measurement in Potenza revealed the presence of, of aerosol uh, that arrived from California at about uh, 10,000 kilometers. And uh, this is a very interesting result. But uh, what is LiDAR? Uh, LiDAR is a class of, of instruments that uses light to study atmospheric properties um, from the ground of the top of the atmosphere. Aerosol um, can characterize um, uh, LiDAR can characterize aerosol, gas, clouds, and uh, also temperature. This presentation reports measurement carried out in the frame of the project Actris Aerosol Profile Pilot Provision to CAMS in near real time. Actris is the aerosol clouds and trust gas research infrastructure and is based on Erlinet. Erlinet is the European Aerosol Research LiDAR Network. Um, the, the LiDAR MUSA uh, in Potenza is one of two reference systems in Actris uh, for aerosol profiling. Uh, now we, we, see, we can see the case of study of 26 October. Uh, in this case, the LiDAR measurements show the presence of two distinct aerosol layers associated with the fires in California. Okay, now uh, we can see the optical properties uh, retrieved by um, the LiDAR system. This, this properties are very important because um, uh, are associated with important information about the typing of the aerosols. In particular, we can see that uh, give uh, information about the concentration, the composition, the size, and the shapes of the particles in the atmosphere. So we can see that from three to five kilometers, uh, values of optical properties could be indicative for a mixture of uh, uh, biomass burning and marine aerosols. Instead, between eight to 10 kilometers, edge biomass burning aerosols are predominant with moderately small and spherical smoke particles. Is uh, uh, it's important to remember that uh, small and spherical particles have a night scattering efficiency. Um, it's important also said that the ability uh, of LiDAR MUSA to probe very thin layers of aerosol with an atmospheric optical depth of 1.6% of the total. The characterization of uh, this um, uh, atmospheric optical depth is associated with the attenuation of solar radiation. This char uh, the characterization of these, uh, of these layers in tropopause is important to, to, to their effect in the climate change. So, in conclusion, um, <coughs> We can say that uh, this presentation have demonstrated uh, how the biomass burning aerosol um, can travel across transcontinental distances and potentially influencing the climate on the planet. Uh, fire, 
fires will increase in the coming years due to global warming. So high resolution measurement of biomass burning aerosol will be increasingly important. In particular, accurate measurement will be needed in tropopause where aerosol have a long residence times and can travel for great distances. In the future, the assimilation of uh, LiDAR data from network like Actris and uh, satellite um, are very important to improve the model skills. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. If you could just, yeah, there's a question for um, Samuel Luthi, um, and this is from David Renka. And he's asking, um, do you have a reference point um, on how much the economy is already impacted by wildfire? Um, how severe was the increase over the last few years? Um, yeah, uh, that's a very good question because um, it's actually impact data is, is a very rare thing uh, in this world. So, uh, so it's hard to get those, uh, especially in a, in a global uh, consistent uh, uh, manner because reporting data so uh, reporting standards are uh, quite a bit different across the whole world and you will be heavily biased uh, towards uh, richer countries that actually have such a thing as reporting standards um this i think i'll just uh, <laughs> uh during the last presentation i opened uh, an excel and made a quick quick calculation um, so I think I'll just refrain. Uh, we use with we work with uh, AM dot uh, data, which is a, uh, a, a an impact database uh, uh, which is maintained uh, in Belgium, and uh, it's one of the few open source uh, impact databases. Um, so I just looked at the U.S. damages, and in the in the period uh, uh, from the so in the two thousand, so from two thousand to two thousand nine. Um, they had uh, they report uh, 11.5 uh, billion US dollars uh, as, as wildfire damages, and uh, when we look at the period, so at the from 2010 to 2019, uh, so the next decade, uh, this number is up to uh, 74.6. Uh, uh, so uh, it's roughly four fourfolded. Um, this is of of course uh, a very rough. Uh, estimates as many many uh, smaller events don't get reported in, in these disaster uh, data sets but uh, but uh, there, yeah I think to have a bit of an answer on it it's certainly not globally concise but maybe with a bit of a US focus we can say something and it's also important to remember that it's uh, not only the fires it's also that uh, for example in the US that people are building nice houses into forests uh, which then cause much more, uh, much more damages. So it's not only the climate impact, but it's also uh, the societal uh, or the exposure uh, change uh, in our framework, which is important. I hope that helps. In Colorado, and, and we had probably six to eight weeks this past summer where um, the, it was just awful air quality because of you know the fires that were burning. Um, and sometimes it was locally, you know, within the state, and sometimes it was California or um, the Pacific Northwest. So it's certainly becoming a health issue as well. Um, okay, for um, Dr. DeRosa, what are the wavelengths used in this study? Uh, okay, in this, uh, in this study, um, we use a free wavelength and uh, uh, 355 um, is the, the first uh, uh, wolverine. Uh, the second is uh, 532, uh, uh, and the first is 1064. Is uh, the typical wolverine that we use in the, in the LiDAR system for the retrie retrieval of uh, the atmospheric composition of the aerosols. And then I was also wondering, Dr. DeRosa, when you were talking about, you know, in terms of the tropospheric transport of these particles, is there a feedback in terms of weather? I mean, I think geoscientists are generally used to uh, volcanic eruptions, for example, affecting yes, the weather, yes. you know, that you were that a yes, but exactly. 
is um, in, in, in reality the um, biomass burning aerosols are very similar to volcanic eruption uh, because uh, when the particles arrive to um, the top of the troposphere so uh, the in, in the stray in the in the trap of house is um, is a typically that uh, particles can travel for long distances and uh, arrive uh, and uh, can um, arrive in the, in different uh, state in different uh, country in in this case uh, we 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 have uh, um, uh, ten thousand kilometers in the in the trajectories. Yeah, to me, it's just amazing that the smoke can travel and be tracked, yes. you know, for yeah, 10,000 kilometers. The, 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 in, in reality, the, also the vulcan er, eruption can arrive during the eruption in, in the stratosphere and uh, uh, have a dangerous impact in the, in the climate change. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. Great. Well, um, are there any additional questions? I want to thank all of our speakers today, um, in, including Dr. Thielen, even though he wasn't able to join us um, for the for the Q and A. Um, and uh, please, if any journalists would like any of the resources that were mentioned here, email addresses, or um, Dr. Thielen's presentation, please just email me on media um, at egu.eu. Um, and uh, there's thank yous in the chat to to all the speakers as well. And then I just wanted to mention that there'll be one last press conference um, of this meeting. And that will start today at 5 p.m. Um, in Munich time, Paris time, 1700. Um, and that is learning from the past, catastrophes, climate, um, and cultural change. Thank you all very much and for your attention and for your presentations.